Hello, hello, hello. I am Matt Williamson at Williamson NFL. How's everyone doing? Kind of an odd time. You know, Steelers obviously played Thursday. I'm recording this as usual Sunday before the Sunday night game after the uh, the late slate. So we really don't even have division news because the Bengals are off. Browns beat Steelers, as you know, and Harbaugh Bowl is tomorrow. So I thought it was a good time. And maybe we'll even do it twice this week because it's a weird one to do mailbag. And I was, as usual, uh, pleasantly, uh, <laughs> really good questions. Yeah, you guys really do ask some good stuff. So Skip Bittman asks, how can the offense be better on first and second down? Seems like 80% of the first downs are hand handoffs to Harris. And I understand where you're coming from. And I do think that is where this team likes to, you know, likes to land body blows in the early rounds of the fight. You know what I mean? Like, if we can bludgeon you now, early downs, big back, big personnel, we think it'll pay off in the second half. You know, like people don't, you and I have talked a ton about, you know, the fantastic second half point differential. Well, I think you put some of that in the bank early on by that. Now, I don't disagree with you. And maybe some more first down play action would make more sense. But here's where I really want to go with this off this question. And the, the nerds will tell you the most efficient play in football is a quarterback scramble. Which leads me to a side note, by the way. The Steelers' defense is remarkably good against quarterback scrambles. It's like first in the league times a million. So if the most efficient play is a quarterback scramble, a called pass that the quarterback runs, the Steelers actually benefit when the opponent does that. So the rest of the league does not. So anyway. But one of the least efficient plays in football, and these are very generally speaking, is a run play called on second and long. I think they define that as six or longer. And the Steelers do a ton of that. A ton. I like Arthur Smith, but that is one thing that makes me a little crazy. I mean, there's a lot of second and eight runs. And there was a lot of them this past week. And that's unacceptable. I mean, it's just too much. Some, fine. But often, no. And here's the logic behind it. Let's say it's second and eight, second and seven. And I call a run and I get four or five yards. You would think that's a successful play. And in some ways it is. You know, you gained yardage. You ate some clock, you you landed a body blow, so to speak, but you're playing to get to third down. You know, like how many times have I told you guys when we talk about third down conversion rate, I'm as concerned about the denominator as I am the numerator. You don't want to snap the ball on third downs. And if you call a lot of second and long runs, which the Steelers really do, that means you snap the ball a lot on third downs. Pretty simple, really. And I don't know if I could ever even find these numbers, probably more of an off-season thing, but I wonder what percentage of second and long plays are runs by the Steelers. I bet it's number one in the league, number 32 in the league. Depends how you look at it, you know what I mean? BetOnline is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for online betting. From the earliest odds to in-game live betting, BetOnline provides you with all the action and ability to watch the games as they happen. With the largest selection of odds on everything from football, NBA, and college basketball, NFL, to UFC, and MMA, head to BetOnline today and get on the action with America's most trusted site for online wagering. BetOnline, the game starts here. David Reed asked a very good question and a very underrated player. How much is this team missing Montrevious Adams right now? 
I'm a big fan. I thought he was really good last year. I was really happy they brought him back. And I think he was even better this year. I don't think he's a great player. I'm not saying he's Joe Green or Aaron Donald. Donald. But he is a very useful modern day nose that can get upfield, that can get some pressure, that is big and physical and is very talented. I'm almost certain he was a five-star recruit and then kind of underachieved a little bit and is starting to realize or has more recently realized how to best utilize those talents. And so I think he's missed a lot because I love Keanu Benton. But I don't think he's a nose because he's just not quite stout enough. I mean, his run defense has become a problem. He is a very good pass rusher. I think he can develop into a better run defender. But I also don't think the last couple of weeks the Steelers have been getting gouged up the middle either. So it's a everyone deals with injuries and they're all difficult to overcome. They've overcome it quite well. I don't know when he's going to be back. I wish I did. But when he does, I would like to see more of a switch to Benton to defensive end than nose tackle, and which brings me to an offseason need. I'd like to see them get a nose tackle type. And I'm not talking about Casey Hampton. I mean, I'm talking about Vita Vea. You know, like, I know that's an extreme case. Don't get me wrong. Dexter Lawrence. You know, like, that's the type of guy you're after there. And I'm not saying Adams is those guys, but he can be 70% of it or whatever. You know what I mean? So he would be wonderful to come back. It'd be a, I need to look into it. No one seems to have a great timetable on that. But they have overcome it pretty well recently. Jaegersberg asked, does this loss mean anything more than just a loss? Should we be panicking or is it just tough luck, bad reffing? I'm not going to say it's bad reffing. But I did look at this game and thought, this past one, this lost in Cleveland, of course, that, wow, that is a glaring landmine on the schedule. And it's going to be a really difficult situation. They haven't been good on the road Thursday nights. They haven't been good in Cleveland. And frankly, leading up to that game, I talked myself into Cleveland being a worse team than they really are. The Winston-led Browns are average. The Watson-led Browns are pathetic. Well, they got the Winston-led Browns on a good day. And frankly, sometimes you have to give the opponent credit. I thought the Browns played very well in this game. Both sides of the ball for them, all in all. And were probably the better team when it was all said and done. Pretty close, but I would say they were the better team. So this leads me to the next question, though. Will asks, do you believe this is a must-win in Cincinnati? After losing to Cleveland, I believe this game is the one we look back on that defined the 2024 regular season one way or another. That's kind of where I was going to go with the original question here is if you let it get away from you, you lost this game and then you go to Cincy and drop one, all of a sudden you're looking at your season a lot differently. And... You still have a lot of money in the bank, though. You know, I mean, you have eight wins already. You probably only need two more to get to the playoffs. But we also don't want to be looking at a team that is happy to get in the playoffs, goes to Buffalo, gets beat bad, or goes to Kansas City and gets beats bad. You know, I mean, to me, that's the floor for the season, basically, no matter how the rest of the regular season goes. is You kind of limp into the playoffs, lose to a much better team, and not very competitive fashion. But can the season be more than that? Can you be the one? Can you be the hammer instead of the nail? I do think this Bengals game will probably tell us a lot because I'm sure that pride or, proud organization and the Cam Haywards of the world are stewing for 10 days and getting a little healthier too. Um, DSR asks... What do you think about Cordero Patterson's lack of explosiveness since he's come back from the foot injury? He seems like a liability out there. Yeah, um, I'm starting to lean that way too. First of all, this isn't kill Arthur Smith day with the second and long runs, etc. But I really do not understand at all 
why you would throw Cordero Patterson a fade in an important part of the game. Now, people be like, Matt, don't you know that he used to be a wide receiver? Well, he used to be a wide receiver because he wasn't very good at it. And yes, he's capable to run wide receiver routes, but he never did it well. And I should know this off the top of my head, but I think that fade route was against a corner who, yes, is smaller and not as physical as Patterson, but knows the nuances of play in one-on-one coverage against a fade all day long. You know, like, that's not going against Pickens or Williams or even Jefferson. You're going against a guy that couldn't be a receiver. And I understand, and there is a lot of Arthur Smith in this, that I know that you know that I know that you know, so I'm going to do something different, you know. And that's fine here and there, but not in gotta-have-it situations. I mean, if that's how you seal the game when you're up 10 or something like that, cool. When you have to have it and it's super important, no. But back to the question, I think you're right about that, that he seems all of a sudden like a very monotone athlete, and maybe that'll change. I mean, maybe the Bengals game like, oh, I remember that guy. Because he is explosive, but he is old, and he also is very heavy. I'm not saying he's fat, but he's just a big human being. And if he doesn't have the burst, if he doesn't have the explosiveness, which is going to leave him soon in his career, maybe it's now, maybe it's next year, maybe it's two years from now, but he's been around the block to say the least, then you can't put him out there. So I do this all the time. And my perfect example ever was Gunnar Olszewski, but I also lumped Allen Robinson in this category. Like what skill position players? Are you trotting out there that the defense says, thanks, I like that you put him on the field because that means somebody that's harder to play against is on the sideline. And yeah, he has a unique skill set, but I can handle it because it's not overwhelmingly unique. Like, yes, it's it's not something you see every day, but if you don't have extreme burst, you can't take care of it anyways. And we talked about this last podcast. I very much think Connor Hayward's in that category now, too, of thank you for putting him out there. Love the defense. You know what I mean? Sincerely, the defense. You know, so the Patterson, even like Skoranek offers more because he's a wide receiver that can block well. And I can still throw him the ball every other game or whatever, not much, you know, part-time player. And he's also really good on teams, of course. Now, Hayward and Patterson obviously have special teams value too, but that's not the question. So, yes, especially if he looks that way against the Bengals, if he's even given the opportunity. And if he isn't given the opportunity, maybe they're realizing that he's not an explosive athlete right now and maybe never will be. Who knows? I mean, I'm just kind of put the carpet before the horse on that. But I don't need ends around to him. I don't need fades to him in the meantime. If you want to line him up as a typical running back and hand him the ball with normal running back plays, great. But I don't think he's a special enough player, especially right this minute, November 24th, to manufacture stuff for him, I guess is the best way to put it. Really good questions. Uh, There's a couple I have stored away. Then maybe we'll do another one of these, maybe even as soon as tomorrow, um, just because it's a little early to really start previewing the Bengals. I won't do one on Thanksgiving, probably needless to say. And there we have it. wonder what happens with uh, Ravens Chargers, too. That's a game we definitely want the Chargers to win. All right. Take care.